The Story of Me is brought to you by Layuna Ontario Provincial District Council. Layuna, feel the feel power. power. Greetings, love of dogs and languages, passion for education and teaching, and compromising affirmation as a woman and as an educator. And I'm sure I could use many more <laughs> adjectives, all good, to define our guest today. And we say hello to Dr. Maria João Dodman. Hello, Bill. Good morning. Good morning to you. It's so good to see you. And thank you for being here. Thank you for the invitation. It's a pleasure. <laughs> the pleasure is mine. Uh, now, I said lover of dogs because in a previous conversation, uh, you sent me a little picture uh, as a child with a dog, which we will show. Uh, and I was impressed by the, the tenderness you, you expressed in that picture for that dog. I see you've got three dogs here. Are mm -hmm. they all yours? No. Uh, ah. the, the black one, Bruce, he's my grand dog. <laughs> grand he only dog. comes to visit and spend time with his Grammy. And then Lucy Lou in the middle, she came from the Azores three years ago. She's an immigrant. She is an immigrant. She mm. has a very good story from rags to riches. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> Lilybird is the oldest dog. Yeah. Uh, and she's a very nice girl. Where does the interest come from? I've always loved animals and dogs in particular. Uh, in fact, that picture that you mentioned, it's yeah. a picture that I have in my office at York <laughs> University. And times, at times people have thought that I was sponsoring a child in a third uh, world country yeah. because it is from another time. It's about yeah. growing up yeah. in different conditions from yeah. my cushy lifestyle that I have today. Yeah. Um, and people mistakenly think that is some, some child in a faraway yeah. country. I ask the interest because as I look at uh, where you were born and your parents, uh, your father was not a farmer. So I'm assuming that there weren't a lot of animals um, around. Your mom uh, was educated in a religious institution. Um, so you had a religious upbringing, did you? Sort of. Yeah. I had to follow what was expected of us back then. Yeah. Um, as young children, um, boys and girls, you yeah. went to school on Sunday, you did catechism. Yeah. Um, those were all things that I always felt were disconnected from my real life. It, they didn't provide me the answers I was looking for in many mm -hmm. ways. I think I was a difficult child because <laughs> I was, I had existentialist questions yes. that could not be you were answered. Curious. I was very curious, yes, mm -hmm. I was very curious and I did not think, at least back then, that religion would uplift me, but it would instead keep me in my place. So early on in life, you, you saw some of the abnormalities of religion, the contradictions. Of course, of yeah. course. Um, women continue to have a secondary status. That's right. In many religious yeah. institutions. So you were inquisitive? Uh, were you a quiet child or I was, I was a strange child, I would say. I was a fearful child. I, perhaps religion did that to me too, also made me too aware of my own mortality and any sinful activities that I could be engaging in that today I know weren't sinful at all, yeah. but we were raised that way. Um, but I had, a, a, I had a strange awareness of death, and I think it's because when people died back then, it was very raw, it was right there, it wasn't like it is here. In your face? 
Yeah. So it's much like, in your face. So much in your face. You, yeah. you see you see someone's grandmother the day before and the next day, there she is in a casket. And then and, she's gone. Yeah. You were born in an island, island of San Miguel in the Azores, but you moved to the island of Fayal at age two. That's right. Uh, your dad got transferred. Yes. Uh, you worked for the post office. And I mentioned that your mom um, was from Terceira Island. So you're Azorian, true and true? Yes. <laughs> um, as some friends tell me, I am uh, Azorian of two islands. Yes. I am from São Miguel, but yeah. I was raised in Fayal. And unfortunately, I don't have that neat accent that people from São Miguel have. In fact, some days, Shame on you. sometimes I've been accused of not but, really being Azorian because I don't have an accent. Accents are wonderful, aren't it, they? Yeah. And, and I love the accents that I hear when I go back yeah. and all the different, all the islands have their own peculiar accents. You said you were curious. Were you rebellious in any way? I think I was rebellious, but I was also smart and clever, and I could hide a lot of things <laughs> that I could be doing yeah. that my parents and the other elders did yeah. not necessarily know about. Wonderful. Um, in, in a story that I read about you in, um, in a book, uh, you uh, said that you were very skinny, uh, almost as if you suffered from malnutrition, and that as a result. Your grandmother took you, I don't know how many times, to a witch to have you cured yes. of your thinness. Is that true? Yes, yes. And I remember the witch was very large, <laughs> and she had a a large belly and she would try to put me in her lap but because of her belly she didn't have a lap so her knees were right there yeah. it was almost like she was putting me on a slide and I was kept sliding and they would talk about me as if I wasn't there it was an evil evil eye um, yeah. possessed by yeah. another spirit um, were you were you cured I was never cured. I, in fact, when I came to Canada, I thought I was this ugly duckling. Yeah. Um, yeah. I didn't know I was good looking until I came to Canada. That's when I learned. Yeah. <laughs> How did that happen? Uh, you were a little insecure about your physical appearance, is that it? Oh, of course I was. Yes. Yeah. Um, I was insecure about that. Um, but um, I was insecure about many things, I think, yeah. because when you have an island existence, you know very little about the world. Um, so I wasn't aware of what happened outside of the island. I was very curious to know. I think you were very curious, and, uh, and I say this because in this story that I read, uh, when you talk about Fayal, which is the island where you really grew up, yes. you said, and I quote, it was too small for me. Yes. So you were aware of the limitations, right? Yes. What did you aspire beyond the horizon? Well, um, I aspire to be, I think I aspire to smell like my cousins that visited from California. <laughs> they were perfumed. The American uh, smell. The American smell. I remember I was obsessed with raisins. They had the... I think they're called sun, sunrise raisins. Yes, they yes, come in yes. these little red boxes. That they took with them. Yes, they when used they to take those. They used to take very eclectic things from toilet paper yeah. to uh, flour and raisins. And I had an obsession with these raisins. And the raisins stood for the American <laughs> dream for me the, the ability to eat raisins uh, outside of a special occasion, for yeah. instance. So the, the raisins became almost like a symbol of something you, you aspired, something different. Different smells, different experiences, right? People look different. My yeah. cousins... Oh, they did. My they, cousins looked They looked look extremely different. polished. Yes, they were very clean. polished. They smelled good, yeah. Now, right. when I look back, I think they look pretty ridiculous because they, they wore a lot of jewelry and rings. And they went out on the island like they were going to a wedding. 
I no? think, it, 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 I think because I'm from the same area that you are, uh, they wanted to create an, an image of, An illusion of, of wealth. Exactly, exactly. Yes. Uh, you're still in Fayal because I want to talk about your early education there. Uh, obviously, you went to school in Fayal. Mm -hmm. High school, at high school in Orta, what kind of student were you? I was, I have always been an A-plus student. Oh, really? Yes. I think Why am I not surprised? Well, <laughs> <laughs> it's not by accident that I became an academic, I suppose. That's right. Um, you um, uh, were interested in languages from an early age. Yes. How come? Because languages, was, languages were the gateway to other cultures, I think. Mm -hmm. I think, and there were certain words that fascinated me uh, in Spanish, mariposa. I just loved mm -hmm. saying that. In <laughs> English, cahoots. And I think I loved cahoots because I had never been in cahoots, so I wanted to be yeah. in cahoots. You love the sounds, eh? I love the sounds of languages, the possibilities that other languages offer yeah. for us to access the world and become yeah. more tolerant, more open-minded, for sure. Yes, I've known since I was maybe 10 or 11 really? that, that I early. loved languages. Yeah. Yes. You must have done well at high school because uh, they asked you to teach there for a while. I did, uh, yes. How was that experience? Uh, it was eye-opening <laughs> because I was barely older than the students I was teaching in my class. That's right. And because I was a new kid, literally, I got stuck with, with a, a class of underachievers, I think. Uh -oh. So, but I think that was a good experience for me because it taught me that everybody has different styles of learning yeah. and you got to come up with angles to awaken their curiosity yeah. that are not necessarily the usual ways. And these were older students, by older I mean uh, teenagers, right? Yes. High school? Yes, they were, they were, um, no, they were Many of them were preteens. Uh, many of them had been. This was the second round or the third round that they were trying to to do. Um, but it was it was a good experience overall yeah. because I yeah. learned to be I learned to be a better communicator. If all your students are great, then nobody way, challenges in you. In some ways, it was trial by fire, right? Yes. Yes. Uh -huh which sometimes is the best way to, uh, to go and to learn. In 89, you came to Canada. And the obvious question is why? You're, you have a teaching career in Portugal. Uh, why come to Canada? I don't know if that would have led to a full-time position, but um, uh. the island was small. Ah, okay, uh, we go back to that. Geographically to the size. <laughs> and intellectually. So I wanted, I wanted to see the places that my cousins brought on postcards that <laughs> was sort of like accordions. They would open yes, it yes, up. Yes, yes. You remember those? Yes, of course. And I remember looking at those places and thinking, my God, there are buildings that tall. Yeah. How do people manage? How do people negotiate mm -hmm. space in those large... Yeah. So I really wanted to see the world. Yeah. Now, you came alone or...? No, I married a Canadian citizen and I came okay. to Canada. Okay. Um, did you intend to continue teaching here or, or, or not? No, again, I had no idea what I was getting into. Um, I had to get a job. Yeah. I had very little skills as a young woman growing up in an island. I was 18 years old and I did, I worked in factories. I was also a Molly maid for a while. Uh. A job that I was hired because I was Portuguese. Okay. Only to disappoint my boss because he would say, you are Portuguese, right? But not Portuguese enough? Uh, my <laughs> cleaning was not 
at par with his perceptions <laughs> of the awesomeness of yeah. Portuguese cleaning ladies. So I was fired from that job because I was lousy at cleaning. I still am, but... Yeah, you went to, um, to a small Ontario town, not, not a big town, Dresden? Yes, initially I was in Dresden because that's where my husband lived. Oh, your husband was up there. Yes, uh, and I had no idea, and I was I had no idea that I had traded the island for something potentially even more small-minded. Yes, and uh, you mentioned some of the jobs you got there. You um, uh, you did some soldiering. Yes. Uh, of metal pieces for jeeps. Yes. That was your first job. No, that was my third or fourth okay. job. And then you worked in a plastics factory? I did. As well? Yes. When I was doing my undergrad, there was a summer job. Okay. So you come from uh, a teaching position in the Azores. Uh, you didn't quite know if you could continue teaching here, right? Because languages can be taught anywhere. Uh, did you make an effort at the beginning to see if there was a need for... Well, I, I didn't really know how to go about things. Yeah. Um, I had no life skills in many ways. Um, I was raised before the internet, before you could figure things out. Yeah. Uh, there was an immediate need to ha get a job. I could get a job. I also, I knew that in the small island I could teach and I taught English. Yeah. Because it was a small island, right. there was no one else, but that doesn't cut it when you no. are in, in the big world with lots of qualified people as yeah. well. Yeah. Did you have in the back of your mind a desire to one day be a teacher in Canada or it was not really part of your plan? It was never part of my plan actually. Uh, okay. I, the desire that I had, I think, was always one day I will continue my education. That was the ah. only desire I had. Okay, so you have that. I did, yes. But you, you put it on to the side for the moment. Um, now, I also read about the fact that uh, you, um, you, while living in Dresden, you tried to get involved in the Portuguese club of Chatham. So you tried to, to get involved in the community, but that didn't work? Well, it worked if I knew my place, I would say. Uh, it wouldn't have worked because I am not going from a small mind island to a small minded community. And of course, this was many years ago, and I, I'm sure things have changed considerably. Um, but I still see a lot of those prescribed roles in the community, yeah. how a woman has to yeah. behave, how a man has to behave. Now I return to the community, yeah. but in my own terms. Yeah. This is who I am. I'm That's not exactly. I'm not a religious person. Yeah. I am not a traditional person in many ways. And um, You don't I, conform easily. No. So you're not fitting into the Portuguese community. You've got these jobs that are far removed from what you may want to be someday. Yes. Were you lonely? Of uh, course, I was lonely. I was unhappy. Um, and but, but, but you survived. Of course. Yeah. And I, I, think, um, I think that's how I knew that I was a very resilient person. Um, because I survived a lot of yeah. personal difficulties and eventually I just packed up. I had a young son and I packed it all up and I decided I'm going to start new again. And I moved to London, Ontario yeah. to go to Western. To go to university. To go to university Finally. where I knew no one. What happened that made you uh, make such a huge step in your life? Well, I wasn't happy because I still remained very curious and I had a lot of intellectual curiosity in okay. particular. Of course. And I had a young son. He was three, right? He was very young, here. yes, yeah. yes. And I, I still remember 
uh, I chose Western because I loved the campus. I went for a visit. Yeah. I loved the supports that they offered to single parents like I was. Yeah. Um, I loved the daycare. I could drop my son off on the way to class. Um, but it was difficult. It was difficult but exciting at the same so time. So by now there was no husband? No. Okay. Uh, now, you took French and Spanish at Western. Then you transferred in 99 to the University of Waterloo, mm -hmm. where you got a BA degree. Uh, the dissertation is interesting. Beauty and ugliness in early modern Iberian literature. <laughs> right. So you continued uh, being interested um, in uh, Spanish and Portuguese yes. languages. Yes. Uh, returned to Western to complete your master's mm -hmm. in Spanish literature. Thesis, Women Out of Time, The Feminine Character in the Works of Gilles Vicente. We're going to talk about Gilles Vicente in a moment because it seems to be an area of interest to you. In 2007, you became a doctor. I did. Uh, PhD in Iberian literature, Portuguese and Spanish. This was at the University of Toronto. It was. Wow. Finally, your dream fulfilled. Well, I knew I was going to go to university, but I did not know that I wanted to ever get a PhD. That was sort of accidental. How I, so? Well, I just kept going. <laughs> it was sort of like uh, when I was finishing my master's. Yeah. I had a wonderful advisor, Professor Marjorie Ratcliffe at Western. Yeah. And she's the one that said to me, why don't you study Gilles Vicente? He wrote in Spanish and Portuguese, yeah. right? Not, not, not a lot of scholars your age yeah. are studying this yeah. playwright. Now, for so, people that may not know Gilles Vicente is, he's a, a writer. Basically uh, the father of Portuguese theater from, from the and, 16th and century. And drama uh, expert. Yes. <laughs> um, from uh, Renaissance time? Yes, he's from the 1600s. 1600s. Yeah, very Sorry, correction, from the 16th century. That's 1500s. right, 1500s, yes. exactly. Okay, and you were saying um, this, this uh, mentor of yours and motivated she just, you? Yeah, she just, uh, when I was finishing my master's, she said, what are you going to do next? And I said, I have no clue. And she said, why don't you do your PhD? And I thought, hey, I never thought about that, but maybe. <laughs> and... Uh, Sort of against her wishes, I applied to U of T. She wanted me to go to Madison, Wisconsin. She wanted me to go to the United States. You were rebellious again. I was rebellious again. To your advantage. Well, I think, you know, I, I had a family. I, yeah. you know, she was you a woman. You wanted to stay here. I wanted to stay yeah. local, yeah. let's say more or less. And yeah. I was accepted. And uh, then I never left university again. Yeah. Now. That's right. Uh, and from 2001, you became a teaching assistant at the University of Toronto. Then you went on to 2005 when you started your teaching career at York University. That's right. Where you are still at. Um, and then since 2013, you've been an associate professor of Portuguese studies uh, that's quite impressive. You've gone through all these teaching positions to be uh, an associate professor, eh? Yes. Um, how did you do it? I have no clue. <laughs> well, I have a clue. Um, I work hard. Yeah. Uh, I have worked hard. I have earned what I have received. I, I knew that, you know, I, I thought that I was going to have a different job, actually. I thought I was going to get a position in Spanish. Yeah. Uh, it didn't turn out that way, but um, I was perfectly happy. I actually got a job at York before I finished my PhD. So That's there was right. a lot of pressure yeah, on yeah, me yeah. to finish the PhD. Yeah. And initially, I had a three-year contract. Ah. So after the three-year contract, I was told very firmly, 
if you do not finish your PhD, you're not going to get a job here. <laughs> so I did have to finish Great. it. And then in 2008, they opened up a position, a tenure track position in yeah. Portuguese studies. Yeah. And I applied like other people. And because I had worked hard, uh, I was selected for yeah. the position. And then I got tenure in 2013. And since 2019, I've been departmental chair. Yes, yes, you have. And you, you've really worked hard when you look at some of the things you've done. Uh, you've not only taught many courses, but also um, you have designed many of them, uh, mostly related to the Portuguese language, uh, introduction to Portuguese culture. Was this a first at York? It was not. Okay. Um, at York, there were some courses on the books. Yeah. Uh, but those courses that were on the books in 2005 no longer exist or they have been redesigned. I've redesigned them all okay. pretty, pretty much. Redesigned, Introduction yeah. to Portuguese culture is now called uh, Portuguese, cult, um, Portuguese Luso-Brazilian cultures and cinema. Yeah, because, because you've also been involved with the, with the Brazilian culture, the teaching, not just Portuguese, but Brazilian cinema. Yes. Uh, Azorian culture, as yes. opposed to Portuguese, because there is a bit of a different culture in the Azores. There is, yes. Uh, and that, by the way, it's the only course of its nature in a Canadian university, the one uh, that we have at York. You and mean the Azorian yes, culture? Yes, yes. And it was designed by you? It was. Because I also felt that there was a lot of misconceptions about what it was like to come from the Azores, about the Azores in particular, and um, a lot of uh, lack of awareness of the vitality of cultural affairs in the Azores. Yeah. You also taught uh, courses at other institutions like University of Toronto, University of Western Ontario, while at the ARC. Uh, beginners and the intermediate Spanish and Portuguese. You've You've taught at these institutions. Yes. Uh, so you kind of go outside New York and you do these things at the other universities. Well, I've done before. Um, now I go outside of York when I do guest lectures, when I participate in yeah. conferences, uh, when I'm asked by the community to contribute. I think that's an important part yeah. of being a person of service. I believe in service. and. My number one community is the university community. Yeah. That's why I believe in service, but also to yeah. give to the community. And you have, um, over the years, uh, you've been involved in a countless number, and I mean countless, conferences, lectures, book presentations, workshops. You know, I counted close to 100 on your biography. Uh, we can't mention them by name, but I want to mention them by theme, uh, because um, these themes uh, of your work are as varied as your range of activities. The value of education, writing in the diaspora, vision of India. This is just to show the variety. Azorian identity in literature, the female situation in Gilles Vicente's time. Now we go back to Gilles Vicente, the uh, theater man of the 1500s. Why an interest in this period and this personality? Well, I always loved the Renaissance because we see a lot of the shaping of what we know today um, starting in the Renaissance important discussions about the role of religion, important discussion about the woman question, what That's to right. do about women, um, the Renaissance man, uh, a man that is cultured, that can hold a conversation, that can speak many languages. So I think a lot of those debates that happen a in the Renaissance. A lot of the enlightenment at the time. That, yes, yeah. and those debates I think still inform much of our discussions today yeah. regarding the yeah. humanities. Now, other themes deal with the human condition. You've already touched upon some of that. The voice of women, the plight of the immigrant, aging, aging. grandparents. These are themes 
that I see throughout your conferences, lectures, uh, workshops, so many concerns. What bothers you the most about the human condition? <laughs> and we don't have two uh, hours well, or we two don't days. Have two or hours. I was going to say, oh my God, where, where can I but start? What, what um, really bothers you still today that concerns you to the point of, of going out and speaking about, about this, writing about whatever? I think what bothers me the most is how we have disconnected from our humanity. And what do I mean by that? When we live constantly online, when we uh, obey a certain prescription in the way we look. I mean, my hair is a result of me challenging those stereotypes about aging and women. How we have forgotten what it's like to be kind and empathic. I think the social media, as great as it is, has, have also removed the human connection yeah. that we need. And because I work with literature, I think fiction is really a value today in terms of reconnecting with human emotions. Um, I could say many more things, but yeah, I think it's that, that disconnection that yeah. the modern world has brought. Yeah. Um, capitalism that goes unchecked. How when we purchase something in North America, we should think of how that is produced, what sorts of environmental costs are we engaging in when we go and purchase something that has been potentially made by a child in another country. So I think we haven't stopped, we don't stop enough to reflect on these issues. I think our lifestyles have gotten too busy. There's always something to do, something to post online, something to see online, but it's very superficial. It doesn't really account for um, human suffering, uh, the ability for us to sit here in North America and not think that many women around the world don't have this privilege. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think it, it is very important that when we can, that we all do our parts in, in informing yeah. people more deeply. Do I see a book in the future uh, dealing with this theme? Well, <laughs> uh, currently I'm uh, finishing uh, an expanded English translation of Andarilla. Uh, mostly translated as Wanderer, my book, a, a little book of short stories. That's right, you're an author. Yes. On top of everything. Yes, a little so, book of short stories from 2016. So you're doing that? I'm doing that. I have another book project with a colleague in Norway, um, looking at uh, representations of Canadian identity. Um, I'm also working on uh, my own book project on representations of female beauty. Yeah. in Renaissance, and I have, I've started writing a novel about what it's like to be born and raised in between cultures, like many young people in our community, but that's a longer term it, it's project. It's a work, work in progress? It's a work in progress, And yes. you don't want to talk about the, fa the, the title or anything? I, it's, I too early, it's, it? too early. it's too early, it's too early, it's too early, it will, it's, it will be inspired on a lot of the students that I've encountered throughout the years who are from Portuguese speaking communities and yeah. who, who've had to maneuver a world that is different inside yeah. the house. So you're not only an author of, of these books, but you've written in articles, um, you've written articles in journals, chapters in books, You've done translations, articles in conference proceedings, prefaces, creative writing, articles in magazines, editing. Oh, is there anything you haven't done yet? Um, no. As a writer? As a writer, you're pretty satisfied with what you're doing, right? I'm pretty satisfied that the minute I got tenure, I could devote my intellectual pursuits to anything I chose. Yeah. And I have a lot of curiosities. So while the Renaissance is where I started, it is not where I'm going to end. Right. I think my, my pursuits um, are more looking at the future. I think I want to look more of 
who I want to be as a person now that I am getting older. Um, not so much what sort of professional I am, but what kind of person what I am. What kind of person? Um, I'd like to talk just a little bit about uh, your community involvement, Portuguese community involvement. You've been heavily involved um, with uh, Casa dos Açores, for example, the Azores House of Ontario. You're, are you still in, on the board of directors? No, I haven't been no. for some years. But you, you were. You yes, were. Yes, I was at some, um, at some point. So yes. I've seen you in all kinds of events and with all kinds of people. I know you have quite a, you've made quite a lot of friends, not just colleagues, but friends um, uh, in the Portuguese community. Um, what are some of the highlights of what you've been doing in the Portuguese community? Well, I, um, now that the pandemic has been with us, I have, none of us have been out doing yeah. things anymore. But when, when it was possible for me to contribute, if yeah. I was invited, yeah. I would attend, I would support as much as I could. You've been a speaker at many events. Yes. Special guest. Um, uh, you've received some honors. I have. From the community. Yes. And I'm going to mention some of them, with your permission. Recipient of the insignia of professional merit from the government of the Azores in 2019. Wow, wow. That was a big deal for my family. Yes. Was it? It was. Not yes. for you? It was for me, but I think it was more for them as well. Yeah. Because who knew how this rebellious, strange young girl was going to turn out? I guess not so bad. Not so bad. The Alliance of Portuguese Clubs and Associations of Ontario gave you a merit award in 2009. That's right. That's also a big association, a big award. Uh, USC Teaching Honor Roll Award of Excellence, University of Western Ontario. So this is not necessarily Portuguese, but this was 2003 and 4, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, the Milton A. Buchanan Fellowship in Spanish, University of Toronto, Ontario, Graduate Scholarship, 2004 and 5. You were nominated for the Jackman Graduate Student Fellowship, 2003, uh, and so on and so on. Now, these awards, and I'm sure this is uh, not an exhaustive uh, list, uh, have they given you some incentive or it gives me recognition that yeah. I am pleasing someone, that I am doing a good job. I don't think it gives me any or much satisfaction because I always think I too am a work in progress. So yeah. there's many more things that yeah. I need to do. Um, I think awards, for me, it's more the power of education, yeah. um, the, the duty to be an engaged citizen, yeah. to inform, uh, to be nice to people, yeah. to be empathic. Um, I am part of a community that, it's really a miraculous community because these are people who came to Canada, many of them with very little skills. I mean, yeah. when I came, I didn't have a lot of skills, but the women that came before me, and these are people who navigated this complex world, who built lives, who yeah. made comfortable lives for yeah. their children and their grandchildren. So it is a community that I admire a great deal. And mm. I think it's my duty to contribute, to yeah. elevate it. I think the community admires you. Uh, as well. You have one son. We have a picture up there. Yes, I Brian. Could, I would not ever thought that that woman beside that man is the mother. Well, my son loves that my hair is gray <laughs> because now I look more like his mother. Uh, but before, sometimes we used to go to places and people would say, you know, is your sister okay with it? Like when he was a teenager. And it really bothered him. And he would say, that's my mom. Um, but yeah. Is he I, a teacher as well? 
No, my son is a very different person from me. He works in a company in Waterloo, Ontario. Yeah. And he went to college and he has a degree in uh, supply and demand. Wonderful. Uh, and that's the only son you have, right? I am not a repeat Good offender. He's a, he's a lucky man. Um, you've had such a busy life. Do you take time for yourself to do anything just for yourself? Yes. <laughs> I think the moments that I spend with my dogs yeah. are a necessity that I have. Um, simple things. I, I think sometimes we have gotten uh, really invested in uh, purchasing the next great thing or being at the mall and having these very artificial lives. My favorite thing to do is to sit on the sofa early morning with Lucy Lou. Lucy Lou watches the house. She, her job is security. Yeah. And it <laughs> is that time of day when you might see a squirrel in the backyard or you might see yeah. a rabbit and you know just contemplating mm -hmm. nature around you yeah in a quiet kind of in environment in a quiet environment i've yes. seen some pictures of you uh, in the azores so you've traveled yes yeah do you go there frequently or before pandemic, yes. Yeah. Um, I'm hoping that when the situation improves, that um, we will, I will go more often. I'm also president of an academic association, and we are planning a conference in the Azores uh. for June, end of June of 22. So hopefully, maybe okay. We might yeah. be. You still have relatives there. My entire family still lives. Oh, there. your entire family. I'm sure yes. you've seen a lot of changes. Even Fayal, while remaining a small island physically, um, <laughs> yes. I think things have changed in, in, yes. in, in terms of um, uh, progress yes. of uh, not just material things, but also thinking. I think it's a more liberated country now, no? It is, it is. It's a very different, um, yeah. it's a very different experience that I have going back now yeah. than I did growing up in the 80s, yeah. right? So there is an openness to the world yeah. uh, because social media also brings that. It brings that's true. the ability to connect very easily. And that's easily. the good side of social that media. That is the good side. Um, yes. Now, unfortunately, we're, we're coming to an end. I could, I could spend a, l a lot more time with you, so many questions. We haven't even talked about your positions in boards, in associations. Maybe that's a, uh, a topic for interview number two? Sure. In the future. But I, I wanted to ask you about um, your opinion on, on the future of teaching of second languages in Canada. Does it I guess it continues to be important, uh, or are there some challenges ahead? Yes, we are at a, a crucial, we are at a crossroads. I think for the past few years, we've seen uh, neglect of the humanities and also of languages. Really? Uh, yes, and I think we, we often, we live in a world that is rather contradictory which is we say we value cultural difference, which also obviously includes language difference. But at the same time, we tend to think that English is king, that you can go anywhere around the world and you'll be fine if you speak English. That's an attitude that needs to change. And I think all the ethnic communities need to be more vocal on the importance of a second language on the importance of languages to sort of like an onion, to peel the layers to understand those specific communities. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think we've been as vocal as we could. Um, and, and I think we are missing the boat of what true multiculturalism is. Yeah. That is not an awareness that there are others, but mm. a celebration of differences that includes languages. Yeah. Some work to be done then. Lots of work to be done, yeah. yes. Uh, unfortunately, our work is done here for now. Yes. Um, thank you so much for sharing. 
your thoughts. Thank you for having and me. And a bit of your life. <laughs> it's been great to see you again. And hopefully we will see you for many, many more years, not just in the community, but in the academic world. For sure. Thank you. Thank you. And we thank the audience for being with us. Until next time. Thank you. Thank you.